Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation's uh, webinar of our educational series today. Well, first of all, um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Melinda Bikini, the Director of Advocacy with the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation. I'm also a 12-year survivor of stage four intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. And today we are delighted to be joined by Dr. Sky Mayo from uh, Oregon Health and Science University in Portland, Oregon. Um, Dr. Mayo is board certified in both complex general surgical oncology and in general surgery. Uh, his clinical practice serves patients with tumors of the liver, bile ducts, and pancreas. He also treats patients with gallbladder cancer, cancers of the stomach and digestive system, and retroperitoneal sarcomas. And his research focuses on helping patients with cancers that have spread to or arise in the liver, such as colorectal cancer and enterohepatic cholangiocarcinoma. So welcome, Dr. Mayer. We're so happy to have you, and I will turn it over to you. Um, one quick reminder that um, you guys can put questions in the chat box or in the Q&A box throughout the presentation, and we will do a Q&A after Dr. Mayo's presentation. Thank Thanks, you Dr. for Mayo. that uh, very nice welcome, Melinda, and uh, thank you to Melinda and to Stacy and to the rest of the uh, Clangio Carcinoma Foundation for setting this up. I think it's just incredibly important to be able to have these conversations about a rare cancer um, with uh, the patients themselves. I know it's something we all value in the yearly uh, Clangio Carcinoma Foundation Summit meeting, which is coming up not too far from now. Um, so what I'd like to talk about kind of in context of getting to the clinical trial that we have open at OHSU Knight Cancer Institute in Portland is how we are advancing treatment for patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma specifically um, and the emerging role of mutational profiling and liver-directed therapy as a lead-in to the trial that we'll talk about. So um, I think uh, the important thing to consider for this is for um, bile duct cancers in the uh, cholangiocarcinoma or intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma in the liver, an operation itself is rarely curative. These are cancers that are associated with a high degree of intrahepatic, meaning in the liver and also outside of the liver recurrence. So in general, there are about you know, 11,000 to 14,000 biliary tract cancers per year in the United States. About four to 6,000 of these are intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Um, you can kind of see the schematic there on the right of the different kind of subtypes we talk about when we talk about intrahepatic as compared to the other biliary tract cancers, which include hyler cholangiocarcinomas or Klatskin's tumors, and then gallbladder cancer, and then also distal cholangiocarcinomas. But in general, we are seeing an increasing incidence of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma in the United States. And there are many factors that can go along with this, including what some think is a link between primary liver cancers and um, steatohepatitis or non-alcoholic fat, non fatty liver disease, where you have um, infiltration of the liver with adipose, with, with fatty tissue, um, and uh, it leads to a, a sequence of inflammation, damage, and repair, which ultimately leads to um, a, a cancer. So we'll kind of focus on intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma right now. In general, liver resection itself for uh, cholangiocarcinoma is safe. We're looking at less than a 2% 90-day mortality, and we really kind of look out to 90 days now when we talk about the impact of a big operation on patients. We do know that surgeon volume is important, but really is a surrogate for the institutional expertise and volume, which importantly includes everyone in the preoperative setting, including nursing staff, dietitians, uh, hepatobiliary radiologists, et cetera. And then in the inpatient side, you have the operating room staff who are familiar with these operations, surgeons who are familiar with them. And then on the post-operative side, nursing staff and everyone else who is able to recognize any early complications and help rescue the patient if there is uh, an untoward event. So for all biliary tract cancers, we know that only 10 to 20% of them are resectable at presentation. So that means in another way, in a kind of a glass half empty way, is that 80% are not resectable. And so what are we doing for those patients? Similarly, even if we can offer a resection, 60 to 
um, of patients recur by five years. I think so much so that it's hard for me to actually call this recurrence. And I think it's actually better termed progression of micrometastatic disease. We can only resect what we can see. And we know that there is a micrometastatic disease burden that is just unappreciated by preoperative imaging, by interoperative assessment, et cetera. So how then can we move forward with this cancer with the fact that 20% of people are resectable and of, the, of those that are, a lot of them recur. So I think the future is really going to be better imaging for one, and that's something we're working on here at the OHS Unite. We just now have opened a PET MRI um, with specific liver sequences that we'll be using to better detect uh, disease. Um, but I think it's going to be the integration of systemic and regional treatment for those patients that are resectable and ultimately integration of these two modalities in patients that present as unresectable. So I think with that, we really need to talk about what does it mean to be resectable? If a, if a physician tells you that you're unresectable, um, that, that, that can be for a few reasons. So let, let's talk about that. So one, I think that it is essential, and this has been shown time and again, that patients with liver cancers need to be referred to a multidisciplinary oncology team. And this team needs to include a hepatobiliary surgical oncologist. Only people that do this for a living and offer these resections can actually determine if you are resectable. Now, in my mind, resectability falls into two camps. There's biologic resectability, which means we look at the underlying tumor biology about how fast it's growing, the, uh, what it looks like on the scans in terms of the distribution of disease, elevated tumor markers, et cetera. And really this is a reflection of our kind of gestalt to achieve our, we, what we think will be our ability to achieve a long-term survival and potential cure, potential cure. And as we kind of more deeply understand these cancers with next generation sequencing, um, I, I, I think we're, we're going to make a lot more progress in really understanding what is biologically resectable, um, which patients benefit the most, um, and which patients we need to kind of really have some caution with in terms of how we treat them up front before we subject them to the morbidity of an operation. Now, from a purely technical standpoint, um, there's also a definition of technical resectability, and that is not the number of tumors. It's not the size of the tumors. It's not the distribution of the tumors per se. It really relies on, do you have intact portal venous and hepatic arterial blood flow in to the liver? Do you have intact hepatic venous and biliary outflow out of the liver? And that liver that we're talking about has to be an area that is, can be cleared of all disease. And volumetrically, it has to comprise about 35% of most of the time two adjacent liver segments. Now, one of my partners, uh, Flavio Roca, can tell you that that's not always true because he's done a right hepatectomy and a left hepatectomy, meaning remove the right liver and the left liver in the same patient in the same day, leaving only segment one of their liver, which was very large, the caudic. So meaning, and Dr. Roca is an excellent representation of this, is you need to have an experienced surgeon like looking over your scans. So I, I think in general, if we kind of look at everything, um, this is a, a study that we just published looking at our very rural state of Oregon. And specifically, what we found is that patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma when they are evaluated at a referral center, they are much more likely to receive treatments that are associated with better oncologic outcomes. And this includes people with advanced disease. So we're talking palliation, quality of life. These things, you know, end up like, you know, patients have the benefit of uh, seeing specialists in these areas. And I think uniquely what we found in this is there is this kind of combined evaluation where patients are referred to a academic center and then a referral center 
by their community oncologist. And then there's a partnership with the community oncology team and the academic center that also exhibits a significant survival benefit. So I think this modality itself becomes more important as we move into the phase of telemedicine, where we're able to get opinions for people that live far away. So I, I think this is really important and I hope to see this more. I mean, 50% of my practice is now virtual video visits with patients around the state. Um, they much more enjoy uh, me looking at their scans and uh, seeing them on video than driving eight, nine hours to come see me for me to tell them everything looks great. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, been a, it's, it's been one of the unanticipated silver linings, I think, of, the, of what the COVID-19 pandemic has uh, voiced upon us. Um, so uh, I, I think also, you know, with this, as I kind of mentioned, you only can, can resect what you can see. And what we call a failure where, where uh, patients, you know, may have an early recurrence is again, it's, it's really an issue of understaging. And this actually comes across for all hepatobiliary or liver and pancreas and, and pancreatic cancer, liver, pancreas, and bile cancers. This is another study we did demonstrating that um, we, you can see multifocal tumors much more readily than you on with certain imaging sequences than you can with like traditional single phase CAT scans. So you have to have good imaging in order to see, well, what is the true distribution of disease? Because otherwise you're going to the operating room, you're having the cancer, the only one you think is removed, when really, really there are multiple other spots. And this places you at higher risk and you really should have been treated in a different fashion if, if this was known up front. So I think having good quality imaging is extremely important. So um, I'll skip this slide, but I, I think what also has come to the fore in the past four to five years, especially, and this is something the Calangiocarcinoma Foundation and the uh, International Calangiocarcinoma Research Network, the ICRN, has been very, very involved with, is the emerging importance of mutational profiling of calangiocarcinoma. And this is what I would consider to be the new standard of care for this disease. So if you look at all biliary tract cancers in the section on the left part of the slide, you see there's a vast array of mutations. Now, importantly, you can clearly see that intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and gallbladder cancers have very distinct um, like uh, mutational profiles, okay? Now, what do we know about the trials so far in these? They're all lumped together. Okay, so these are very distinct genetically, can uh, genetically distinct cancers that for the purposes of the rarity of the disease are lumped together. So if you look at the breakdown of ICC or intrahepatic clenched carcinoma, these are the important mutations that we look at. And, you know, just in the past few years, in the past few months, um, you know, these uh, few of these mutations have come to the forefront now as established second line treatment and several such as FGFR2 are actually uh, being trialed in the first line against first line systemic for patients with advanced disease. So again, this just highlights, you know, the different mutations between intrahepatic, extrahepatic, and gallbladder. So ERBB2 is, you know, HER2 amplification. And I mean, that's very distinct. Gallbladder cancer, 16%, intrahepatic, 4%. And then if you look at IDH1 mutations, which was just reported in the CLARID E trial, that's 20% intrahepatic, where it, is, it just it is not existing in extrahepatic and gallbladder. So these are very distinct cancers and I think should be treated as such before we draw conclusions about what treatment is best. So in, in general, you know, this is uh, kind of the established lines right now when we look at it. Right now, gemcitabine cisplatin is the established first line for patients with advanced intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Um, there are other regimens that are kind of, you know, being, uh, you know, evaluated. Um, and uh, there's this great cartoon you can watch for the mutations matter, um, which, uh, you know, uh, I believe Stacy, I mean, Melinda, the Clangia Carcinoma Foundation received uh, um, some, uh, an award from uh, for uh, their work and the profiling of Clangia. Um, so let's move specifically to intrahepatic Clangia Carcinoma, which is really a unique primary liver cancer. And by primary liver cancer, I mean it's arising within the liver itself. 
Um, so specifically, it arises in the bile ducts. So it's the second most common um, uh, in the US. Here we have 8,000 cases a year. And this is where the variability of four to 8,000, it's somewhere in that range. In Oregon, we have about 80 cases a year. And I know this because I just looked at our cancer registry for the state to, to look at this. Um, it is increasing in instance, like we talked about, and you know, the importance of mutational profiling is centered in this disease. Now, if you look at this CAT scan, um, a way to kind of look at CAT scans in general is the is the right side of the screen, the right side of the image is the left side of the image is the right side, and the left side, the right side is the patient's left side. So it's like you're looking um, in cross section, like at a loaf of bread, and you're looking at the feet, and you're looking up. So, um, and all of this gray itself right here, um, one of our, our uh, awesome radiologists here at OHSU, Ellie Korngold, it terms this evil gray is what she calls it in terms of what it looks like for, for uh, how these cancers appear in the liver. So in general, um, you know, for intrahepatic cholangic carcinoma, right now, if you're a candidate for resection and most high volume cancer centers consider you a candidate for resection, if your cancer can be removed with negative margins, with all of those things about the amount of liver remaining with good inflow and outflow, like you know that, that those are accounted for, and that you don't have any high risk factors such as multiple sites of cancer within your liver, positive lymph nodes, like disease outside of your liver, uh, vascular invasion where it invades blood vessels, et cetera. We have a a trial that Dr. Mattel has, uh, has uh, just completed a cruel and for patients with high risk uh, intrahepatic cholangic carcinoma. Now, if you're not a candidate for resection, there are other therapies to talk about. Um, and they're called, can be local regional therapies, um, such as Y90 radioembolization, chemoembolization, radiation therapy. Um, and what's not on here is intra is uh, intra arterial hepatic infusion. So I'll, I'll take a chance to talk about that. So about liver directed therapy specifically. So hepatic arterial infusion has been all around for a long time. We're talking like since the 19, you know, 70s, 80s is when this was kind of really being looked into. Um, this is a schematic as of what we're often doing is we're sewing a catheter into one of the arteries that lead into your liver and we're establishing our, a flow, a path into your liver where the artery going in is the only artery supplying the liver. And that if we introduce chemotherapy into it, there's no other artery that's competing for delivery of blood, um, of arterial blood. And this allows the liver to be completely perfused. Um, so importantly, the liver itself is a pretty amazing organ in that you're able to deliver certain agents in it. In this case, the most widely used is what's called FUDR or floxuridine. And we usually give it concurrently with dexamethasone. <clears throat> we surgically implant this pump and then we program the pump to deliver a fixed rate of the chemotherapy at, um, uh, you know, uh, every day for about two weeks at a time. Now, importantly with this, we can achieve upwards of 400 times the concentration of what you can achieve if this same drug was administered, administered systemically, and that's because of the metabolism within the liver, and because 95% of it undergoes first-pass metabolism, you have very minimal side effects, um, meaning that you don't know that you're actually getting 24-hour-a-day treatment um, with, with this. So that, that's uh, how we can use the liver to take advantage of delivery and really maximize the quality of life maximal liver treatment with minimal systemic effects. So <clears throat> this, uh, for this uh, disease specifically, was reported on a trial that was put forward by Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, with Andrea Sersik there and uh, Bill Jarnigan, and, it, uh, and then expanding it to Washington, St. Louis. And specifically what they did is they enrolled 42 patients overall with unresectable intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma as determined by hepatobiliary surgical oncologists. 38 of the patients received HAI plus systemic, 92% were chemo naive, meaning they hadn't seen any treatment at all. And in overall for this, four patients or 11% were converted from unresectable to resectable. 
And one of those patients had an amazing enough response and a complete pathologic response. The one year survival for this was 90%. The median overall survival was 25 months. Now, if we're talking compared to the standard of care, which was the ABCO2 trial, like that trial reported, you know, 12 to 13 months as the overall survival. So it's it's actually it's it's quite remarkable. Um, and you know, and and this arm itself, uh, uh, the, the I say the arm, the uh, treatment of uh, gemcitabine plus cisplatin, as we're seeing with other disease sites, is as we are able to better select patients and also treat um, the side effects chemotherapy. Um, you know, that survival of the standard of care arm in 2000 and, you know, 10 um, in the ABCO2 trial is increasing over time. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's much higher and that hopefully will be reported in the Dr. Schroff study, the SWOG 1815 trial that completed accrual um, uh, most recently. So how have we done this at the night, um, Cancer Institute in Portland, Oregon? I, I think really for hepatic arterial infusion in general, and specifically in expanding this for an indication for intrahepatic cholangio, it's really been a journey of constant reevaluation of how we can do this for our patients and how we can adapt it to our institutional culture um, and really uh, do this in a safe way. So importantly, I think a, a program, an HEI program, um, is more than just a single surgeon who puts in a pump. If that's how the program is set up, that program fails and it's not very well structured. It takes all of these and many more that I can't fit on this slide in order to run the program. From medical oncologists who know how to tailor the treatment, medical oncology, social work support, including survivorship, nuclear medicine, surgical pathology, gastroenterology, everyone to really run a program like this. Um, so it's a team effort, um, and uh, you know I, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, so let me show you an idea of kind of what's possible with hepatic arterial infusion plus systemic therapy and staged hepatectomy. So this is a 68-year-old healthy man with no underlying liver disease who presented you know with fatigue and a large liver mass biopsy proven with locally advanced intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma multifocal disease with no mutational, actionable mutations. So in summary, big cancer, invading a lot of important stuff and multiple sites within the liver, but it wasn't spread anywhere outside of the liver. So at baseline, you know, this is his scan and you see that evil gray again, and it's pushing up on the whitish structures in the centers, which are all of his blood vessels. So un, un, unable to be removed technically, all over his liver, so biologically also unresectable. Um, he was treated by a very thoughtful oncologist um, who gave him a gemabraxane um, or nabpaclitaxel. Um, and th this was not the, really the standard of care, but was his desire to avoid the side effects of platinum-based uh, chemotherapy and the inherent you know, uh, numb fingers, uh, neuropathy, et cetera, that come with that. So after um, I, he, he then came and saw me, his CA 99 had gone from you know over 2,000 to less than 100. He saw me and I put a pump in and I treated him for an entire year with hepatic arterial infusion and systemic therapy. Now you can see that that evil gray has really kind of changed colors a bit and it's really contracted down. His tumor marker had gone down to the normal range at this point. So we did something for him um, called a portal vein embolization, which is something you, we, you do in order to trick the liver so that the side that doesn't have the cancer that's clear of disease will grow large enough so that you can remove the vast majority of the liver uh, and not go into liver failure. So we blocked off essentially, you know, uh, for him, um, I say you have nine segments in your liver Segments one are the caudate, two, three, four A, four B, five, six, seven, and eight. We blocked off the blood flow in the portal vein to all segments of his liver, with the exception of segments two, three, and his caudate. Um, after uh, four weeks, we rescanned him. His liver had grown am amazingly and appropriately. I took him to the OR six weeks later. This is kind of a graphic picture. I apologize. Um, and you can see the coils there. 
which, uh, uh, which is what allowed his liver to grow. You see the little radiation beads within the blood vessels themselves. And importantly, he had just minimal amounts of viable cancer left with um, extensive fibrosis throughout. Um, the little portion in his liver, we weren't certain if it had cancer or not, and the liver remaining was, uh, did not have any evidence of any uh, cancer in it. All of his lymph nodes were negative. Um, he'd had several more removed at his initial operation, um, and the additional bile duct margin was also negative. So an incredible response for this guy. Now, right now, you know, this is what his liver looks like now. So he has just a few segments left in his liver and it's grown. He's done well overall. He's been off of chemotherapy since February, 2020. Um, he had a small bowel resection just a few weeks ago. And it's an amazing thing to be able to take patients who have such advanced disease to the operating room for kind of standard stuff like a bowel obstruction like, you know, a normal surgical patient. Um, and I think we have a lot to learn from him. You know, why did he respond so well? Um, and what do we do when we push patients like this almost to the brink of liver failure with such extensive treatment? And I think these are kind of the questions that we need to answer, you know, now. So now this brings us to our Helix ICC trial, which is what we're gonna be talking about today, which is a trial we have open at OHSU. Um, so the inclusion criteria for this trial is that patients must have surgically unresectable liver dominant carcinoma or multifocal, meaning multiple spots within the liver. Again, that's a high risk disease biology. Um, they have to have a good performance status. That's what ECOG means is the performance status about basically how much time you're able to do self-care, spend out of bed, you know, you're moving around. Um, you have to have good liver function. That's what the child's pew means without any evidence of disease outside of the liver. Importantly, you have to be, have microlite satellite stable disease. Now that's important because 5% of patients that have this cancer actually are eligible for immunotherapy um, as first line, such as pembrolizumab or nivolumab, which I have another patient for some slides I deleted from this who had 100% pathologic response um, after we treated with, um, him with uh, several months of this. Other mutations, because they're only second line at this right, right now, are allowed, including HER2 amplification, IDH1, and FGFR. And we allow up to one cycle of systemic with gemcitabine, cisplatin, before enrolling. This is to make this patient friendly for the patient that often has a delay to diagnosis before they figure out what's going on. They finally get started on something, and then they find out about the trial. So we had a couple patients where this happened, and so um, that's why we... Uh, um, you know, uh, ha ha uh, have this allowance. Importantly, uh, you can't have any uh, biliary drains at this point with central liver obstruction. You can't have prior treatment with Y90 or internal radiation or external radiation because it increases your risk of bile duct scarring. You can't have portal hypertension in your liver, which, um, you know, causes increased operative risk. And you can't have had prior treatment with Fluoxyridine or FUDR, oxaloplatin or, or arena TCAN. Um, and I'll kind of explain why in a second. <clears throat> so, this is the overall trial schematic if you look at it. Um, and it really starts with um, kind of the baseline where we want to make sure before we subject you to the patients to an intensive sequence of treatment that we're really doing it for the right reasons that we have done all we can to exclude that the patients have disease outside of their liver or that they're not gonna benefit from this. So the patients get an MRI, I do a laparoscopy, I do a lot of biopsies, um, look around um, to make sure that the disease hasn't spread outside the liver. The patients are then enrolled after screening period one and go into treatment period two, where they then are treated with two months or eight weeks of fulfirinox. And this is based upon institutional experience that we have seen with people having an incredible response to this regimen. And at the time we designed the trial, the Amoebica trial was actually looking at this um, regimen specifically compared to gemcitabine cisplatin. So we still think it has a role and I don't think it should be thrown out with the bathwater, so to speak, um, because it did not show a benefit in a really a basket trial with, um, with patients that had disease outside of their liver and also included other types of biliary tract cancers. Um, 
After that, the, the patients are allowed to recover for four weeks. We get restaging again. We see how their cancers responded to the fulfirinox. We take them to the operating room, place a hepatic arterial infusion pump. They recover for two weeks, and then they start their first cycle of HAI chemotherapy alone. So no systemic component at this time, okay? Two weeks later, we now you'll see are moving to a full fury, and we have dropped the oxaliplatin. And we've done that specifically, okay? One is we want to see for these people who we know that only 10% of them are going to go on to be able to pos potentially get a resection, that's what the memorial data showed, is we're wanting to maintain their quality of life and limit the side effects. So through this, if we can select people that are really gonna have a liver disease only biology, can we limit the systemic side effects at this time and control their disease with liver-directed therapy? Two weeks later, they get HAI fluoxyuridine sandwiched with systemic 5-FU, okay? And then another two weeks later, they get full fury at that time. So you see, they're really getting a rena tecan just one time a month um, at this. And then at the end of this, um, uh, uh, you'll, you, at, the, at the end of this uh, trial, there's some few things we'll talk about. There's end of study biopsy that we do for research in order to really assess how the cancer is responding to this. Um, and then we individualize um, the patient's response biochemically, as well as radiographically, and just how they're feeling and how they're tolerating it. And we make a decision as the research team recommendation about what we think the patient should pursue, whether that's continuing this regimen, switching regimens, or if they've had progression and they have mutation, considering another uh, targeted treatment. So the primary objectives of the study is really disease control at six months. So it's a short study overall, but I think important. You know, it's the first study looking at intrahepatic cholangiogenic carcinoma only, like in the liver, treated with full furanox, and then with the systemic regimen. Um, we, I designed it as a six patient safety run-in, meaning that we wanted to show that this was safe and feasible in six patients, and then we'll expand it to accrue upwards of another 24 patients afterwards. So you'll see all these arrows throughout. And what this means, and I want to point your attention to, is we have some very unique aspects of this trial. One of them is we have a, a quality of life quote survey. It's more than a survey, okay? So patients are filling out surveys, but it's more than just, you know, are you depressed or not? Are you sleeping or not? We also have a medical anthropologist who works with one of our school of nursing PhD, R01-funded nursing investigator who has an expertise in, in, in quality and end-of-life care for patients with advanced liver cancer. And they interview the families and the patient at baseline and throughout the treatment period. And now we're actually adding it four to six months after the completion of the trial because it's been so well received by the patients. Um, but in addition to that, we're really flexing the muscle of the Knight Cancer Institute and the fact that it is exists within a health sciences university. And we have multiple investigators looking at all of the potential um, ways that we can better understand this cancer. Specifically, we're looking at like exceptional responders to this sequence of treatment and importantly, the non-responders. So we can learn something about it, okay? Um, we're looking at effects on the immune microenvironment with one of my partners, Robert Isle, um, as well as uh, um, looking at the radiographic response and how can we predict what, can what parts of the cancer are responding, et cetera, with, uh, with Dr. Alice Fung. And we'll be moving this endpoint to a PET MRI here with the next expansion. So this trial has been open for accrual. Um, to give you an idea of what's happened so far, we've enrolled four patients per date, basically one patient per month since we opened, which is pretty good for a rare cancer. Um, and we have pre-screened failed two patients with metastatic disease at laparoscopy. So highlighting the importance of really knowing what the, uh, at the outset, what, what, the, um, what the, the distribution of the cancer is. Um, and I can update this now, but right now we have our third patient um, almost done with treatment period two. Two of the patients have undergone their end of study biopsy, um, and we have one patient right now who's uh, 
um, in treatment period one, and I'll be putting a HAI pump in in the next, um, you know, two to three weeks. Um, so right now, I think when we get to five patients, we'll be expanding this for an additional at least 15 patients. Um, but I think we know we've learned a lot from this trial. We've learned specifically, you know, that our first 40 patients that I put, quote, off trial, put on off trial, put pumps in for colorectal liver metastasis, and also that one patient that I showed you um, who had that great response, I think really informed our experience and our conduct of how to do this safely for people, okay? I think there, importantly, it's highlighted, you know, a balance of pre-screening and selecting patients in a thoughtful, but really a semi-urgent fashion. You know, people, like, by the time they come to us, have often been feeling unwell for months, they've lost weight, they feel they've had delay to care, but at the same time, we can't just put them on treatment the next day. We have to make sure we're doing it in a safe fashion uh, for them. Um, we opened this trial at the height of COVID, okay? So we have learned to adapt constantly and kind of really work through our workflow about how to conduct a trial um, during you know, the challenging inpatient and operating room and clinic schedules that exist now. Um, this trial has taught us a lot about the flow of clinical specimens through the cancer center at multiple time points. This is a complex trial. I mean, we have multiple specimens. We have multiple locations. It's not like you're only getting your treatment in the infusion center. You know, it exists. You're in the hospital with your operation. You're out, et cetera. Um, I think also really, um, you know, valuing our medical oncology social work team. One of the things that we have established is that every patient at OHSU who is considered for HAI therapy sees one of our medical oncology social workers to really help evaluate them to see if it's the right treatment for them. Like anything, HAI treatment is not the right treatment for every patient, okay? So it's a big investment by the patient, by their family, and by, you know, the research team, by the institution. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the patient is going to get the most out of it and do it in the safest fashion. Um, patients really, so far, have appreciated the quality of life interviews. I think, you know, we've just added that sixth interview um, four to six months after the end of trial, um, because what we're seeing is, so many people when they're diagnosed with this are kind of left the impression they have, you know, six to nine months to live. Okay. So now you've survived six to nine months. So what, what is your life like now? Um, and what does survivorship mean? And I think that's where our, uh, our, um, our quality of life, the medical anthropology and nursing investigators are really highlighting this for our patients. And I think importantly, you know, all four of these patients who, who we're treating here came to the Knight Cancer Institute because of this trial. So they would not have come here. They came from, you know, outside of Oregon, you know, et cetera. So I think there is a need for an adaptable precision trials like this. Um, it's a short trial looking into it. We're learning a lot from it. We're testing the disease biology, and then we're allowing um, the, uh, the patient and the research team to come together to adapt and see, based upon all the evidence on the response, what should we be doing for your cancer? And that's not the same treatment for everybody, okay? Um, so I think in summary, for unresectable intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, you need to have a consultation with a multidisciplinary team at the outset, okay? For treatment sequencing, operation, um, evaluation of what we say would be your future liver remnant or the liver left behind after an operation, and then the potential integration of liver-directed therapy if appropriate. Mutational profiling for this disease at the outset is essential, okay? It is a standard of care. Um, it is challenging in some of the biliary tract cancers because it can be tough to get a biopsy, okay? The ones that come up to come to mind are the hyalur cholangiocarcinomas or or Klatskin's tumors, where it's brushing. So it can be really challenging to get a, uh, not only a diagnosis, but enough tissue for mutational profiling. And I think patients and clinicians need to have a full understanding of the therapeutic, operative, and clinical trial options available. And amazingly for this disease, that has really exploded in the past three to four years. I think, you know, there has been one regimen, gem cyst since 2010, okay? That is not the case in 2021 um, for the other options available. 
Um, and I think you want to be considered for um, at an institution that has an expansional region, expansive regional therapy program that includes hepatic arterial infusion, selective internal radiation therapy, or Y90, SBRT, or um, you know, focused radiation beam treatment. Then ultimately, liver transplant in select patients. So seeing being seen in a program that can offer that a complete spectrum of multidisciplinary care, I think gives you the best option. And now with the ability to do, you know, telemedicine, um, I, I think that a lot more patients can kind of seek out that opportunity. So with that, um, I'll close. Uh, this is uh, the um, uh, Eagle Cap Wilderness um, in Northeastern Oregon. Uh, this is a mountain range in the Wallowas. It's a great place to hike. Um, Oregon's beautiful. Come out and visit us. It's beautiful. Thank you. That was wonderful, Dr. Mayo. We have had um, several comments and questions, so I am going to get started on those. Um, I, one question is, what, what is your knowledge on um, the hereditary nature of cholangiocarcinoma? If my mother had this, what are my chances of getting it, is what was being asked. Oh, that, that's a great question. I mean, I think we're, we're learning more and more about that. Um, you know, I, for many cancers, it comes down to when was your mother diagnosed or when was your, your relative diagnosed with cancer? The earlier it is, the more likely it is to have a genetic predisposition. Um, there are certain mutations in general that do predispose you to uh, an increased risk. Um, one that comes to mind is called a BAP1 mutation, um, also associated with melanomas. Um, you know, but there, are, there are, are some others. So it depends upon, uh, you know, if you have a family history, basically if you're under 50 years old, okay, and you are diagnosed with a cancer, you should be referred for genetic counseling to answer that exact question. That is also a standard of care and recommended by the NCCM guidelines. Thank you. Okay, and then I think you answered that uh, this, um, is this trial solely for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma? And it sounds like it is, yes. Yep. We are opening uh, other trials uh, for, um, unre for unresectable as well as um, resectable uh, colorectal liver metastasis as well. Um, with the data that's come out for hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC, there was a trial just published, a randomized phase three in China um, that randomized patients with unresectable um, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma outside of transplant criteria to, um, uh, to taste or transarterial chemoembolization versus hepatic arterial infusion. So I just had a conversation with our team this morning about, you know, considering and expanding, you know, the indication for HAI treatment uh, for this. And it, that trial did show a superiority to taste um, or the transarterial chemoembolization. So I think, you know, we need to refine these for other disease sites. As well, yes. Um, what does complete metabolic response mean? Okay, so um, I may have said metabolic. I apologize. So a complete pathologic response okay. is what I, if I, if I misspoke. Yeah, a complete pathologic response means that when we section the cancer or the specimen um, in the surgical pathology lab, that there is no viable cancer remaining. You will see like treated areas that scar and dead cells, but no viable cancer remaining. And that's indicative of um, a, an incredible response, a much longer survival overall. But unfortunately for this disease and many others, it doesn't mean cure yet you can still have a recurrence even with a complete pathologic response. And this is true for pancreatic cancer and everything else that we see. Gotcha. Um, Somebody is asking if we can have access to this presentation. The re uh, presentation was recorded, so you can have access to the recording um, to be able to see it again. Uh, and the recording will be available shortly after the webinar. Um, Let's see, okay, there's some more questions over here. Did you indicate that patients that have previously been on aranotecan and oxyoplatinin are not eligible for this trial? Uh, yes, I mean, I, I think that we would need to look at that in kind of a case-by-case -case basis. I think 
If you ever have a question about your eligibility for a trial, you just need to be evaluated and seen um, because there are always loopholes and gray areas. For instance, if you had full Fox, you know, a limited amount, you know, 12 years ago because you had colon cancer and you haven't had any sense and you have no residual effects, then we would consider you for this, you know. Um, if you got arena TCAN, but you know, for a dose, but didn't tolerate it and then switched chemotherapy regimens to something else, we would consider you. So I think always err on the side of uh, seeing the oncology team and asking the investigators specifically if you'd be eligible. Case by case scenario and always yeah. ask. Always yeah. ask. Okay. Um, mom's tumor was found when she presented with a portal vein blood clot. Does this make her ineligible for a pump? No. Okay. Uh, good to know. Um, any benefits to liver directed treatment along with systemic if you have localized lymph node involvement? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think so. I mean, uh, you know, the, the, uh, for the, the longest time, you know, the trials um, uh, or um, data has shown that if you do have, you know, well, so I'll take a step back. So your liver drains to lymph nodes, the lymphatic fluid does, to lymph nodes that are in your, around the, the structure called your porta hepatis that leads up to your liver. And so when we do these liver operations, we remove a lot of those nodes, okay? Now, sometimes those nodes will contain cancer. It makes sense if they contain cancer that you likely will have a lower survival overall, but um, uh, you know, but it, it doesn't mean that you won't derive some benefit from you know uh, treatment with uh, with this you know specifically. Um, so you know we remove a lot of those nodes. Um, if we're talking regional nodes, they'll be removed. If they're kind of nodes out way outside of the liver, like, like down in your retroperitoneal, you know, like down behind your big blood vessels in your body, so away from liver, or commonly what we see with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma is um, lymph nodes in the kind of the sac that surrounds your heart called your mediastinum, okay, or elsewhere. Um, that, that is what we term really extrahepatic disease or disease outside the liver, and that's the purpose of the PET scans and everything else. Now, I will tell you, just because you have an enlarged lymph node doesn't mean that you have cancer in it, okay? Um, and we have a patient on our trial who had enlarged lymph nodes, and we actually put her through some biopsies. And the biopsies revealed just inflammatory tissue, no cancers. And when I took her to the operating room after two months of treatment, I took out a lot of those lymph nodes, and they had no cancer in them. So they were just, you know, benign, enlarged, inflammatory lymph nodes. Okay. If I understand your presentation, patients... Um greater than stage one who have had radiation treatment and or some other types of chemical treatments do not qualify for the pump? Uh, so it's not that they don't qualify for the pump, it's that they won't qualify for this trial specifically. Okay. okay. So again, I think on a case by case basis, if you've had prior treatments, et cetera, um, you know, see your, your treatment team and, uh, you know, and be evaluated for it. Um, we kind of have a strict set of criteria that we follow. But what we do individualize it because uh, not every patient is, uh, you know, um, can really, you know, their, their, their course up to that point can't really be templated at all. So there's a lot of individualization that has to occur. Right. Okay. And I think just a little more clarification with um, inclusion for the trial, there can be no metastasis outside of the liver. But I want to go back to that, um, I guess, that inclusion criteria. Why are you treating systemically with chemo if we can't have metastatic disease outside the liver for the pump? Uh, that's a great question. I, I think one is what we see with this has been borne out in other studies is that treatment with the pump really works when we're kind of sandwiching um, the, uh, the disease, so to speak. So we're attacking it from inside the liver by delivering the high dose chemotherapy and then on the outside, we're also circulating, you know, a similar chemotherapy um, to help treat the liver. Now, we know that patients do develop disease outside of their liver, and that's that micrometastatic disease that's in circulation. So I think doing liver-only treatment right now for this disease is not what anyone would recommend. Even the trials that have been done with Y90, et cetera, those are all done with combined systemic treatment. So, you know, you want to treat 
the liver disease itself, and you also want to keep in mind the systemic disease. As the liver disease becomes more so that it's the the biology is telling you it's only in the liver after a long time, then you can kind of start to ratchet down the systemic to like minimize the side effects and continue the liver directed therapy if the patient continues to tolerate it. So outside of the trial, would there be um, an indication for the HAI pump with metastasis to, um, the question was to the spine that was treated with radiation? Um, so it, it, it depends. I mean, and I think like, you know, it, it, it really, it depends on, you know, I would seek out an evaluation um, and then uh, at least at our institution, these patients are presented in a multidisciplinary tumor board and we would review it. And the, the question is, is, is that spine metastasis itself, um, one, was it really a spine metastasis? It often comes up. Um, these can be tough to biopsy. You can have other things in your spine that look like METs that really aren't METs. Um, and if it was treated, um, uh, like how has it responded and does it have any activity indicating that it's still alive? And is that the only side of the disease? You know, right. if it is, then, you know, we can talk about controlling the liver disease. But I mean, again, we don't ever want to hurt you in the, with the goal of that we're trying to help you out. We only want to put you through an intensive treatment, through an operation, et cetera, if we think it makes sense with the cadence and the biology of your disease. Okay. So I can't remember if you touched on this, but are those with previous resection eligible if they have a recurrence to the liver only? Yes. Okay. Yep. Out. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, you know, like I, I think even they would be actually trial eligible as well if they have an unresectable recurrence and or multiple spots of recurrence in the liver and if they never got any other chemotherapy in the adjuvant or the post-operative setting. So they would even be eligible for this trial. Okay. Um, can you chat a little bit about why choosing the PET MRI? Could this help um, lead become a standard for Clangio in general based on these results? Yeah, no, I know. I mean, I think it can. I mean, I think, you know, we're really excited uh, with our radiologist Nadine Malik and Ellie Korngold and Alice Fung and Alex Gumerez and Brian Foster, who are really looking to expand this into our disease sites so that we can get both a metabolic, meaning like how active is the cancer, and uh, anatomic like evaluation of the cancer itself. Now for the liver, it's, it's very important. You'll see a lot of liver surgeons get liver MRIs. We get those for a lot of reasons. One is it shows really small disease really well that you can't see with traditional PET CT imaging. And this becomes even more important in people that have had lots of treatment or in people that have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease where a traditional CT scan doesn't evaluate the liver that well. So that's one. Two is it, it can give you really incredible anatomic imaging to look for the, the always almost present um, uh, anatomical variants, which um, can impact how we approach an operation and how we ultimately may have to reconstruct after an operation um, based upon, uh, you know, um, if someone has unusual anatomy in their bile ducts or in their arteries, et cetera, in their liver. Um, so I, I think it, it can, it may become a new standard of care. We're looking at it as well for treatment response, okay? And this has also been done at some, at a, a, some other centers looking that, well, after extensive treatment, if the cancer was quote hot or really active on a PET scan before treatment, and now after treatment, it's less so, does that less so actually mean that the cancer is really responding and how much so? Um, so I, I think it can help guide care. Awesome. Um, so if not eligible for the trial and um, they're seeking to maybe have a pump, where should they look to get that? And does insurance routinely cover the placement? Yeah, so I mean, if it's, uh, so the, the, the placement of the hepatic arterial infusion pump is approved by the majority of insurance um, if done at a center that, does it, that is uh, um, uh, of expertise as is worded um, in the guidelines. 
Um, most insurance will cover a clinical trial, like you know, participation in a clinical trial for patients. And Melinda, you can answer this more than almost anyone um, as a patient advocate and uh, as a patient yourself. Um, and uh, yeah, so insurance will cover it. In terms of where to go, um, I think you want to go to a place that's you know that's you know been established that has a quote program in place that uh, doesn't have kind of one uh, like one person just doing it. That's really kind of part of a team mm -hmm. with uh, that kind of you know this this part that I'll emphasize. You know, I'll click the, okay, like th okay. this right here. Um, true multidisciplinary team because this is what it takes to do it well. Okay, this is what we believe it takes to do well, um, and it's not just one person that that does it. I I am part of an incredible team um, that I'm just really fortunate to work with. Yes, that's awesome. Yes, we encourage everyone to have a multidisciplinary team. A comment for you after dealing with. Uh, Cholangio carcinoma for 13 years. This was the most understandable presentation I've seen. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Oh, that means a lot. Thank you. And I happen to know that that patient was a recipient of an HAI pump. So that's good news. Okay. Um, okay. Um, yes. All right. So I'm just going to say if there were any questions that did get answered, please feel free to email them to me and I can pass them on to Dr. Mayo. Um, let me go through my list real quick. Um, Oh, I know. So in the future, do you see using the HAI pump for like targeted therapies to target those mutations as well as immunotherapies? Are you reading my research notebook, Melinda? Did you get a copy of it? Yeah. <laughs> I no, did I, not. That was my question. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I agree. I mean, right now at the, the night, I mean, this is why I was recruited by Dr. Drucker was to uh, deliver new targeted therapy in a novel fashion. For patients with liver only disease. So that's what we're working on right now. My collaboration with the multiple, you know, scientists that are part of this trial, um, you know, specifically is looking at signatures um, within the cancer itself um, that we can actually target. So right now we're in the process of a, of a trial to kind of target the disease in a unique way, because I think the intersection of treatment for this has to be both achieving response and keeping quality of life like in mind. And if you can achieve response by maximizing treatment with a targeted therapy delivered in a targeted fashion, okay? So it's like, you know, it's, it's targeted in general for a mutation, and it's targeted in general for going only to a certain area. And if you can keep it in the liver alone, then you're not like exposing the rest of the body to those side effects. Like that's kind of the, the holy grail of, of a regional treatment. Yeah, um, that's, so that's we're, we're, we're launching a series of uh, phase 1B trials uh, within that with hepatic arterial infusion. Awesome. Keep us posted so we can get the information out. Thank you so much. This was a wonderful presentation. We appreciate it so much. Um, and I'm sure we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Mayo. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time. Have a great day. Bye-bye.